Good morning, everyone. What a privilege it is to bring God's Word after that exhilarating time of worship. It's always a privilege to bring God's Word to God's people. I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 1. That's Paul's letter to the Philippians. From Philippians 1, and I'm reading from verse 12. I think you will be able to see the reading projected up front. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes, Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. We were singing about that. And then down to verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. And here's the verse I want to focus on most of all. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. When was the last time that you received a gift that you didn't really want? I remember on my 21st birthday, and yes, I can still remember so far back, my dad uh, had some brothers and sisters who were quite well off. And so when this one aunt of mine brought me a present, I was hoping for something rather good. <laughs> and I must say, I was very disappointed when she gave me a pair of socks. <laughs> <laughs> they might have been nice socks, but I was hoping for more than socks. Now, the same lady, my aunt, I think really improved her batting average when it came to our wedding day. And she gave to Anne and to myself a wedding present that was one of these copper works, you know, these nice big copper works that usually has an elephant or a rhino or something like that. But ours didn't have that. Ours had a picture of the Last Supper my wife, Anne, hated it from the first moment. She said, I don't like that. <laughs> I love copper work, and I was ambivalent. It was okay, it was nice, and so it had a place in our lounge. Not, uh, not a very prominent place, because Anne saw to that. And um, one day, uh, we were thought, well, let's go back to the shop because we don't see our aunt all that often, I'm sure we can swap this last supper for an elephant or something that we would like more. And so we went into the shop and the lady said, oh, no, you can't do that. She said the lady who came in was quite insistent. She said, these two are very religious. <laughs> and so they must have this picture of the last supper. And so we felt, no, it wouldn't be right to change it. And then the day came, and I say this publicly, that I couldn't see it behind the door. And I said to my wife, where is it? And Anne said, I gave it away. <laughs> she said, neither of us liked it. <laughs> I said, you can't give it away without my permission. But she had given it to the SBCA or whatever. <laughs> and I don't know where it's gone. I want to speak this morning about a gift that not too many of you want, but maybe you need it more than you want it, because I want to speak about the charismatic 
gift of suffering. Yes, that's exactly what I mean. The charismatic gift of suffering. The verb that the Apostle Paul uses in Philippians 1, we read the passage together, is exactly the same root. It's the same word except it's in the verb for charismata, spiritual gifts. So Paul says, it has been given to you as a charismatic gift from God, not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for him. I remember walking around the golf course at Durbanville Country Club, and Gary Player was conducting an exhibition of golf, and people were around him, and so he was chatting to the crowd as he played his shots. And someone asked him about his son, Wayne. Now, Wayne was a professional golfer. Uh, It seemed to many people that he had at least as much talent as Gary had. And someone said, Gary, do you think Wayne is going to be as good as you are? Gary Player said straight away, Wayne is never going to make it. And the people were rather surprised. They said, why? Gary Player replied, because he isn't prepared to suffer. That was interesting. I think that in a spiritual sense, folks, that there are many Christians who don't make it or who won't make it, and I'm speaking in the sense of growing, becoming spiritually mature. They won't make it because they aren't prepared to receive God's charismatic gift of suffering when it arises. You see, I believe that when suffering comes to us, there's also presented to us the opportunity to receive this suffering and with it to receive God's grace in a special way. In fact, I believe, and we saw the the Apostles' Creed projected and we all recited it together, I think we could have added something. I also believe in the charismatic gift of suffering. I believe that true Christian faith is actually shown in our approach to suffering. Now, if we ask most people, most people who are unbelievers would say there is no redeeming aspect to suffering. Suffering is negative. Suffering is purposeless. But for Christians, it is different. For Christians, it can become an opportunity for God's grace. Verse 29, for it has been given to you as God's special grace gift to suffer on account of his name. Paul says in Romans 5 verse 3, we even rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Hebrews 2 and verse 10 says that God made Jesus perfect through suffering. And if that was necessary for our Lord Jesus, how much more will it not be necessary for us? You see, God uses our suffering to make us more like Jesus. God uses our suffering, or he can use our suffering if we will open ourselves to receive his grace with it. He uses our suffering to make us more like Jesus. You see, my friends, for the Christian, suffering isn't a curse. It isn't just something negative and purposeless. It's a blessing because God's grace comes with it if we respond as God intends. Now, I want to move to the text. I want to prove what I've said to you. My first heading is the chains of suffering. Verse 13 and verse 14, the apostle writes, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace God and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, he writes. And in Paul's case, they were literal chains. He was in jail in Rome or in Ephesus, and around his two wrists there were shackles, there were chains. It was called an halusis. Halusis was the chain. 
a short chain that went from his wrists to the wrists of his captor. You see, Paul was chained by the wrist to a prison guard. Now, I'm sure that for most of us, that's never, ever happened. But I think there is no one here in this room who has not undergone the chain of suffering. Perhaps sometimes they are literal sufferings. Some of you today are in wheelchairs. Others uh, bear the, the results of an illness or an accident, and they are sufferings that are with us all the time. Some of you have had rugby injuries. Some of you have things that have happened in the past that have left their mark quite literally on you. Perhaps they are emotional sufferings. Perhaps it is illness, an emotional illness that has really been your Achilles heel down through the years. Perhaps it's the past that casts its dark shadow on you or a deed in the past that still causes you pain. Perhaps it's something that caused you before the service this morning to be deeply emotional. The suffering, the chains of suffering that come to us. Perhaps it's spiritual. The pain of being misunderstood. The pain of opposition. The pain of that dryness of soul that comes to all of us from time to time. Suffering isn't pleasant. I don't think we must pretend that. Suffering is difficult. Suffering limits us personally. They limit us personally. Verse 13, it was a chain that bound him to his, uh, to his captor. Paul couldn't move easily. Paul couldn't write, take up the pen. And so he used an amanuensis or a secretary to do so. Paul couldn't perform his ablutions unless the captor uh, undid the chains. Paul couldn't turn over at night easily because his chains held him. They limit us personally. They seem, these chains, to be negative. They seem to limit and restrict us. But, my friends, they don't limit the Lord. Look at verse 13. Paul says, as a result of these chains, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard. Everyone knows that I am being imprisoned for Christ. Throughout the palace, fellow Christians, said the apostle Paul in verse 14, have stood in the gap and they realized with Paul being absent, they needed to do something more. And they have preached courageously and fearlessly. Verse 14. So my friends, we can see God using suffering as a grace. As a grace gift to promote the gospel. You see what these chains do? These chains of suffering result in open doors. Verse 12. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And so what can happen by the grace of God is that suffering can result in open doors for the gospel. We'll come back to that. Because this morning we're also focusing on suffering, but also those who suffer directly for their faith. And in particular, we're looking at the ministry of open doors. I remember the very first time that Brother Andrew came into this country. And I remember how excited I was to hear his stories of how they were smuggling Bibles into communist countries. And they said, well, God has given us this ministry. And in those times, it wasn't possible to take Bibles legally into many countries. And so that was the ministry of open doors. But let me move to my second heading, the sign of suffering. Verse 28. The Apostle Paul actually says that what has happened to him is a sign to them that they will be destroyed and that you will be saved. The sign of suffering. He's been saying to his listeners and his hearers and readers that suffering has a special significance for the Christian. 
And so stand firm for the gospel. Don't be afraid of opposition because suffering, he said, is a sign from God. And so as Christians, we can rejoice in suffering because suffering is a sign from God. Now you say, well, what does this mean? How is suffering a sign from God? To whom is suffering a sign? Well, in the first place, it's a sign uh, for the Christian. In verse 28, he's speaking to Christian people. This is a sign to them uh, that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. And the you is Christian people who will be saved. And so suffering has a special significance for Christians. Verse 29 is clearly, uh, it has been granted to you. In other words, those who believe are able to respond to and receive God's special gift. And so for us as Christians, we can rejoice in suffering because suffering is a sign from God. It has special significance for us in a way that is not true for those who are not Christians. Let's look at what Paul says. He says suffering is, and I've said it before, God's charismatic gift. Verse 29. The same word for charismata, the same word that is used for faith, for prophecy, for tongues, for healing, is the word that is used for suffering. Suffering can be and is God's charismatic gift. Now, I'm dating myself a little bit, but some of you might remember a Methodist preacher whose name was Bert Fuel. Can you remember him? Anybody? No one? Oh, you are obviously haven't come from the promised land, from Cape Town, uh, because that's where he was. He was the father of Gavin Fuel, who was Western Province wicket keeper. You might remember he was uh, his dad, and he was a preacher. He was an amazing lay preacher who just stood. He had no notes, and he would speak for 10 or 15 minutes, and somehow the grace of God just came on him. He was a remarkable evangelist and preacher. I remember asking someone one day, why is it that Bert Fuel has this special anointing? And the answer came back, and I'm sure it was right, because God has taught him to suffer. I've never forgotten that. But this isn't just any gift. Paul says it is a very special charismatic gift. Now, I won't try and grade the spiritual gifts, Seems to me the Apostle Paul puts prophecy uh, at the top. But what I want to say is that suffering is not one of those gifts at the bottom of lesser importance. I would place it right towards the top in terms of its usefulness for us and for the body. Philippians 3 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ. Then he goes up a step and the power of his suffering and then he reaches a crescendo. I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I want to tell you that my own experience has been that I have learned more in times of suffering than I have learned when the going is good. When things are easy, you think that everything is good. But actually, looking back, you grow most in times of suffering. 2000, I'm not sure sometimes we feel like saying amen when, when we're suffering. The year 2014 and 15 were the two most difficult years that Anne and I have ever had. 2016 has been wonderful. <laughs> We've almost been in heaven in 2016. But <laughs> why the suffering? We didn't feel like saying amen, but when we look back, we can see the lessons that God can start to teach. And I want to say that I've learned more through suffering than I have through my spiritual mountaintop experiences. You see, God gives more grace through suffering than through miracles or tongues. The Apostle Paul says something more. He says not only is suffering God's charismatic gift and a very special gift at that, it is God's guarantee that we belong to Jesus. 
Suffering proves that we are true disciples of Jesus. How do we know that we belong to Jesus? One of the most obvious, most certain proofs is that we have suffered for Christ. Verse 28, the end of it says um, that this charismatic gift of suffering is in fact there, for it's been given you as a charismatic gift, not just to believe him, but also to suffer for him. It is a sign from God. A sign of what? A sign that we belong to him. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, uh, Matthew 5 verse 11, blessed are you when, he doesn't say if people persecute you, he says when people persecute you. Hebrews 12 verse 6, the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. He punishes those whom he calls his sons. You see, it's actually a privilege to suffer for Jesus. I remember a time when I went through a very dark period, a very difficult period in my ministry. It was my first ministry. Then I remember John Wilton saying to me, Peter, perhaps you should look at this in a different way. See it as God saying to you, you belong to me. You are very special, and I have confidence in you. And I found that a great encouragement. But not only is it a sign to the Christian, verse 28, it's also a special sign to the unbeliever. Verse 28 at the beginning says, this is a sign from God. It's a sign to them that they will be destroyed. In other words, those who see life as meaningless, those who approach suffering as just being something totally negative and meaningless, actually show that they don't see things from God's perspective. And so says Paul, and he uses strong words, they will be spiritually destroyed. They will be removed from the presence of God now and forever. Why? Because they don't belong to the Lord and it's shown in this particular way. My friends, I want to say to you that your courageous suffering is a testimony to the world. Many of you in this congregation have suffered and suffer at the present moment. This week I was speaking to one of our members a lady who lost her husband 20 years ago in an aeroplane hijack. She wasn't aware of that until, until two or three days later because they didn't know how many had been killed when the plane crashed. As her daughter seemed to be very happy and going forward in life, uh, her daughter lost her fiancé who was killed in a motorbike accident. Some of you will remember that. Today we think of Christian martyrs who suffer directly for the gospel and we see that their courageous suffering is a testimony and an encouragement to us. But let me move on to my final point, the open doors of suffering. We can see God's grace in suffering because God uses suffering to open doors for the gospel. We've already read verse 12. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. In other words, it's open doors, spiritual doors, that wouldn't otherwise have been opened. Time and again, this happens to the Apostle Paul as he ministers on his missionary journeys. And so we can rejoice in suffering because suffering opens doors for the gospel. Let's read verse 24. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously um, and fearlessly. You say, for whom does this open doors? Well, first of all, it opens doors for us. Verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance, and by that he means for my spiritual good. How and when do we grow spiritually? We grow most spiritually during times of suffering. That's why Paul can say in Romans 5 verse 3, we rejoice even in our sufferings, 
because we know that suffering produces Christian character in us. We grow, we become better. God makes us better people. He makes us better followers of his. I remember reading about a famous violinist who used to make his own violins. He used to be very careful in his choosing of the wood that he would use. And so he would go not into the forest because there uh, the trees, the wood would have been protected. He used to go to the cliff side and then he would choose those trees that had been exposed to the full force uh, of the gale and of the wind. Because he said he knew that those trees were made of the right stuff. Romans 8 verse 28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. Both Pastor Trevor and Jason referred to Genesis 50 and verse 20, when Joseph, as he finally sees his brothers, and he reminds them of the great harm and sin that they had done, he said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish the saving of many lives. And so we see open doors for us. We see open doors for other Christians from verse 14 to 18. And you see, what Paul says is that our endurance in suffering encourages other Christians. And other Christians have stood into the breach and they had begun to preach and to testify fearlessly. Suff the suffering of the persecuted church encourages us today. As we are reminded of how people have suffered directly for the name of Christ, it encourages all of us, it mobilizes us, it excites us. But then, of course, doors are also opened for the growth of the gospel. That's what Paul says from 12 right down to verse 18. My friends, this is true of the history of the Christian church. During times of persecution, the gospel has grown strongly. There was a saying in the early days, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. When there was persecution, uh, the church grew all the more. When persecution stopped, the gospel didn't grow so much. When Christianity became the official religion of the Holy Roman Empire under Emperor Constantine and it became the done thing, what happened was the church relapsed into apathy and into compromise and then the church moved into the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. I often receive uh, SMSs and uh, emails and so on, urging us to pray when there is an instance of persecution. Pray for the people who are being persecuted. I'm not convinced that this is how we should pray. I think we should rather pray that the gospel would advance, that the gospel would grow. Why do we pray against all persecution when we see that persecution is God's special gift to us and an opportunity for the growth of the gospel. I think the land of China is the best example. In 1948, when the communist cultural uh, persecution and revolution took place, the Christians went underground. There was no visible Christian church in China. It's been estimated by missiologists that there were about 50,000 Christians who went underground. How many were there when Christianity was permitted, when it was legal to meet in churches? Missiologists have estimated anything from 50 million to 100 million. 50,000 became 50 million when the church had gone underground. So you see, suffering can result in open doors. Let me remind you, and we move to modern times. More Christians were martyred in the 20th century directly for their faith than in all the previous 19 centuries put together. People are dying for their faith 
today, Christians die daily for Christ. And so I close as we focus on the ministry of open doors. I've said quite a lot of things, but uh, I think I've been in the ministry long enough to know that people don't remember everything that a preacher says. I'll test some of you. <laughs> if you get one or two of my headings, then I think you're doing well. But remember only two things of what I've said today. The first is this. Remember the persecuted church. Remember the persecuted church. And Pastor Trevor is going to conclude on that note. And we're going to have an offering. And it will be both symbolic, but it will also be concrete as we identify with those who are suffering for Christ. That's the first thing. Secondly, remember that suffering isn't a curse. Suffering isn't a curse. It can be a blessing. It can become a blessing if we allow it to because it brings God's grace with it. Philippians 1 and verse 29, I go back to my key verse. It has been given to you as a special charismatic gift from God and from the Lord Jesus Christ, not only to believe in Christ's name, but also to suffer for him. So Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its relevance. We thank you for its power. We thank you, Lord, that the gospel is powerful and that we don't need to be protected by the state or anyone else because when we free God's lion, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will take care of himself. And so we give you thanks for the gospel. We pray for those who are suffering today, those in this congregation. We bring them to you in Jesus' name. And we pray especially for the persecuted church and ask that as they suffer, the gospel will advance all the more. In Jesus' name, amen.